James Watson is here. In 1953, he and Francis Crick discovered the structure of DNA. For this achievement, they won the Nobel Prize, and they changed our view of ourselves and the world. He was just 25 at the time, and he was still left with another unfulfilled goal, to find the perfect wife. His latest book, Genes, Girls, and Gamov, chronicles his life just after the discovery of the double helix. I am pleased to have him back at this table. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to have you. Now, why did you write this? What is it you want to tell us? And why do you feel so strongly that this was a book you were uniquely prepared to tell, other than the fact it was your life? Uh, it was a big event, and uh, the book ends, you know, I'm 25 years old, yeah. and uh, uh, I thought people might want to know what happened afterwards. And yeah. uh, uh, some people who read the manuscript said the book should be called The Morning After. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was a big event, and uh, how did other people react to it? And yeah. uh, yeah, how long did I stay happy? Because most people think of, when they think of you, they think of the double helix, right? Yes. That's the book. Yeah. Right. And that happened when you were 25. That's the story of you at 25. Yes. And so uh, I decided to continue it for three more years. Yeah. And uh, sort of let people know, you know how scientists behave. Uh, there aren't many books that do yeah. it in the detail Take I Take us did. inside the life of a scientist. Yeah. Did I stay happy instantly? Did I just yeah. go smiling? Uh, yeah. you know, uh, well, not very long, because uh, after a while I got bored with DNA. Yeah. In fact, pretty fast. Uh, you had to do something new. And uh, so the new thing was uh, RNA. We wanted to find out how the genes worked. Right. And right. until I knew what the structure of DNA, was, uh, what RNA was, I wasn't going to be happy scientifically. I was going to be discontent, and uh, of course you've got to alternate doing science with finding some reason that might make you content, yeah. and uh, uh, this was the pursuit of a girl or girls. Yeah, <laughs> and how did so, that... <laughs> <laughs> now, so, do you believe that you have this great... I mean, you are rem in remarkable health, it seems to me. You look great. I mean, you look at this picture of you. I mean, you look pretty good. I was 26 then. Yeah, and you're how old now? Uh, 73. So that we're talking about 50, almost 50 years. Yes. You know, and uh, I sort of feel the same. You know, I can't think my brain has changed. Uh, I look different. Well, let's talk about the brain for a second, and then come back to the book. It's a, there's lots of things that say a. We we all know about cells regenerating. We also have been told that this notion that that you know our brain cells deteriorate and. And we know that there are certain kinds of diseases that affect our brain with deterioration of our brain cells. Uh, but there's other new information, I'm told, that breaks some, that offers some new ground as to how we stay alert and how our brain works. We seem to be producing uh, some new cells. Exactly. Every day. Yeah. And there's great controversy. Are those new cells the basis of new memories? Yeah. Uh, most people say no. I just have feeling it has to be partially true. You do? Yeah. We have to be creating new cells. I can't believe you use the same cells to, say, uh, memorize Rachmaninoff's third as you do the second. But since we don't know how you memorize <laughs> the second, you don't really know. Yeah. I, I want to ask you some questions that, that I would have asked you if you and I were, that you've been asked a thousand times before, but they're curious to me and I think curious to the audience. What's the biggest mystery for you in science? Uh, now it's uh, how we store information in the brain. That's what I thought. Yeah. I mean, uh, Fifty years ago, the big question is, uh, how is genetic information stored? We know a lot more about that now. Yeah, that took us, you know, we saw the double helix that convinced everyone was the gene. It had to be stored in DNA. And how was it? Mm. And that's partly the, the quest which uh, this book is about. Uh, uh, we knew what the gene was, we thought we knew how it was copied, but how did it act? And uh, it acted in some way by producing, uh, what you say, the uh, DNA is the script for life, and the actors are proteins. So the script defines the actors, uh, but what were the rules? And uh, the moment you read our manuscript, 
someone could say, there's a code out there, there's a code script. What's the nature of the code? And one person who read the uh, manuscript and quickly wanted to find the code himself was the Russian physicist George Gamow. Yeah. And uh, he wrote us this sort of wacky letter. It came to us in July 1953. He'd read the second of our papers, the sort of longer, simple paper. And uh, he read it in California. He got to Michigan and wrote a letter on the University of Michigan Union Stationery. And Francis Crick and I got it. And uh, we'd heard of Gamow, of course. He wrote a lot of popular books. And the letter was amusing, but slightly not cakey, and we thought <laughs> we're probably never going to see him again. But then he entered into our lives really quite forcefully. There's about you two things that I find enormously attractive. One is this idea, there's a twinkle about you. There is a sense of curiosity that is, that is youthful about you. you. In fact, you say in the book somewhere that, you know, you, you, you ought to be one of the great things to do if you're over 50 is to hang around with people who are 25. Yes, I mm. mean, People were generating new ideas. Yeah. The other thing is this passion. You do have this intense sense of passion and obsession and, and uh, about things, which is a quality that most of us, A, admire and, in, and like, I think. No, and, we don't have it. Some don't have it. Some do have it. Yeah, I've... Some people think I want to move too fast. Yeah, I know they do. And, uh, but I'm not happy unless some... You know, you get an answer to something. Something should be well done. And uh, so if my brain wants to solve problems. I don't quite, you know, no one quite knows yeah. what, you know, makes <laughs> the brain tick. But, uh, yeah, I just uh, want answers. So I don't want someone else to, you know, tell me an answer because it thinks it's right. I want to know it's right. And the big question we don't know is how the brain stores Yes, and you know, once you, how you store it and how you retrieve Re it. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, but we do know it's a molecular and a chemical function. Well, yeah, basically it has to go down to molecules, but yeah. we think there's not going to be you know, molecules in which uh, you know, the memory of a face is. It's somehow infinitely more sophisticated and involves many, maybe hundreds if not thousands of nerve cells simultaneously. And, uh, so far, you could say no one's up to the problem. And you know, how you begin to crack it, I don't know what will happen. But uh, it's nice to have such a big problem out there because you, you, know, you can't say, well, <laughs> you know, the best things are over. You can say the really difficult ones, the best things are ahead, mm -hmm. which is nice. You draw some comparison between the pursuit of romantic love and the pursuit of scientific discovery. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure, you know. you know. I've been thinking about love. Well, it has to be controlled by genes because it's the most important human quality. It, 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 the, the kind of women we like is controlled by genes. No, you but think? the fact that we have this, you know, sudden feeling for someone, yeah. you know, a mother has for a baby, uh, uh, that yeah. has to be somewhat instinctive. Uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, how is it that we sort of, I mean, what do you think about this notion of who we end up with and what, I mean, uh, is it scientific at all? Is it genetically based at all? Or is it just sort of oh, I, I can't say, but... Random uh, choice. Uh, what? Know, uh, hundreds of genes must, you know, interact so that uh, you like something. You know, it can't be one gene, one like. Yeah, it's yeah. a very complicated we don't thing. Have a, we don't have a taste gene we have for, for, for everything. No, but making me think this way makes me think, well, if you need hundreds of them, there would be hundreds of ways in which you could lose love. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's some people who, you know, don't... You know, it's this whole question of emotions, and uh, which is dominates her life, where do they come from? Uh, you know, does having emotions mean you're conscious? Did consciousness come when you had emotions? Uh, you know, uh, is a fly conscious? Does a fly have emotions? I sort of figure, probably fish certainly do, and I don't know how. Why do you think fish do? Because they have opiate receptors. <laughs> they have endorphins. 
So, I mean, that's a lot of, you know, the basis yeah. of our... They have emotions. You mean they're sad and they're happy? And no, no, they have the molecule. Yeah. They have the molecule underlying it. It's a bad day because there are too many fishermen in them. On the <laughs> no, but... <laughs> around. I sort of, you know, become... That's my current obsession that, uh, you know, happiness is a reward for doing things which you should do as uh, an animal, such as eating, uh, you know, getting a woman, uh, yeah. solving a problem. And if you don't do them, you shouldn't be happy because uh, then you wouldn't seek the woman, you wouldn't seek the food, you wouldn't try and solve a problem, and someone else would be, and you would go extinct. Or you would... So, uh, you know, it, it's trying to... Uh, yeah. You know, understand myself. Why I, am I, uh, what motivates me? Now, this is written, in a sense, to say, what's the life after the double helix, number one? So that's yes. about you, what happened to you. Yes. On the other hand, it's supposedly, what's it like to be a scientist? Yes. You know, is your life as a scientist, you think, typical? Forget the notion of your personal uh, whims. I, I think so. Uh, you know, we don't stay content very long. We have yeah. to do something new. Uh, the most startling intellectual quality is curiosity. Yes. And, uh, you know, it was the realization, well, during those years I shouldn't have been happy. If I'd been happy, you know, I wouldn't have persisted. Uh, finally, when I got to Harvard, you know, things began to gel and, you know, I had reason to be happy. Yeah. But if I'd been happy just because I'd done the double helix, then you know, I've been a rather pathetic people. People would point out, oh, he made that great discovery. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Francis Crick must have done it because he hadn't done anything <laughs> since then. So, you know, always feeling, you know, that Francis was had a better brain than I. You know, it. Uh, I had to keep going. You know, I didn't want people to, uh, you know, self-respect. You think Francis had a better brain than you? Oh, sure. Do uh, you really? Or you just say that? Well, he knew he could do things I couldn't. You know, he could do mathematics, and uh, I was never good at that. So you uh, were what, good at one thing? I was a biologist. Still, am a biologist, and uh, so the basis of my thinking is evolution. You know, everything is a product of evolution, and uh, uh, so I want to understand biological phenomena. You know, Francis started out in life wanting to understand physical phenomena, and he changed, so he's like me now, and, you know, he really wants to understand the brain. Yeah. That's been his ambition for 25 years, at a period when my ambition was, you know, understand, cure cancer. And uh, was, Francis wanted to understand the brain. Yes. And, uh, he's remained steadfast in that obsession. Steadfast, and, you know, you could say, well, he got in a little early, but, he, you know, he didn't want to work on something unimportant and it's sort of a good problem for a theoretician but to me it's sort of you know understanding cells and yeah. how they go bad uh, and I, you know as I get older too many people die of cancer I wanted to stop mm -hmm. so you know it's again the why, same why thing doesn't, why can't we do more than we're doing often people are well <laughs> It's a hard problem, you know, just admit it. And that's it, right, it's, it's, it's not hard. easy, that's part it's, of the reason. Yeah, it's not that you know, we're, we're failing at something yeah. easy. But, uh, yeah, I'm a disciple of Judah Folkman, and I think, right. give it a try. A disciple of Judah Folkman? Yeah, you know. He, Meaning, well, Judah Folkman is the great cancer researcher. Yes, uh, and he thinks that it has to do could, with blood supply. Yeah, right? if you can stop, you know, it, it has to do with a lot of things, but it, it, maybe the easiest way to kill all sort of cancer cells, which we know are constantly changing and generating new mutation. It's just yes. a, uh, the cut off the blood supply. Then you don't have to worry about the genetic heter heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. But uh, that answer then turns out to be simple as a nice paper, which it does matter a little. On yeah. the so, you know, you, uh, you think it's simple and it gets more complicated, you go back. But uh, it still seems to me disease that we should cure. You know, it doesn't, I, I can't say, you know, it's too hard for us. What's the most important thing you've done since the discovery of DNA? Uh, probably being a writer. I wrote a good textbook. And uh, my uniqueness probably lies in liking to write and, you know, write about people. Mm. So, uh, you know, Francis is a good writer, but I thought, 
his books won't have the impact of mine. Mm. Because he's not as good a writer. No, maybe he just wants to do science more, and you know, I yeah. <laughs> chosen this other niche. And now, why uh, do you think there's that difference? I mean, you you like the public response. That uh, feeds people. I like to write. It, well, I know, but it, but but well, liking to write is one. But you don't just put the. If you just like to write, you could put this. You could you know you could bundle this up and put no, it in a drawer. No, but sure. But if if you think you have a story which, uh, you know, a good story and. Uh, you know, there was a story about how DNA acted, so I wrote a textbook. But the story had to come before you could write a good book. Yeah. And uh, people would say, well, you don't have a story in this book. But, you know, I have some wonderful George Gamow letters. <laughs> and uh, so in part the book was written, you know, to put a yeah. fabric around the letters. <laughs> what should they, the audience listening to us know about George Gamow and that, that you think is most compelling about him? Because it is genes, girls, Gamow. Well, he had... I don't mean he had a wonderful me. brain, and he had an interest in everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, right. you know, from cosmology yeah. to atoms, and right. life was uh, somewhere in between. And, uh, uh, and he liked to have fun. I think that was it. So and do you. He, yes, you know, his, uh, you know, as a theoretician, you can't think all the time. And Dick Feynman... Uh, you know, played the, his drums, played the drums and, and, and went to Las Vegas and yeah. uh, drew nude women and you know he was you know he couldn't yeah. think uh, so much so that some people thought he was a little spacey. Yeah, I did. I mean, I didn't I, either. But I mean, that, it was true because he was so different. He broke the mold of what we think of as a scientist. Yes, and uh, very refreshing. Yeah, and uh, you know he's a minor character in my book right. because he, we met him. He was a member of the RNA Thai Club yeah. and. Uh, after the book end, he actually tried to do biology. He was beaten by Francis yeah. Crick. Uh, possibly because Francis had someone really to talk to, and Dick was trying to do it all by himself. <laughs> Dick has never been the collaborator. Yeah. He just did it by himself. And uh, uh, So Dick was... Uh, yeah, he, he was different. Yeah. Uh, this book is called Genes, Girls, and Gamma. Uh, it is sort of... It's... It's after the double helix. Yep. It is the life. And you understand you and your own life, and you also understand uh, Cambridge. There's a chapter on Cambridge in July of 55. Uh, and it just goes on and on. The thing that you regret about your life, what is the great regret so far? We haven't cured cancer. Yeah. That's my great regret. It really regret. is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, because it's difficult so I wanna, because we haven't spent enough money, because we haven't focused enough. No, we no, no, no. We've spent a lot of money. You know, I don't think money's been our problem. What's, our problem <laughs> is what? The best minds haven't focused on it. It's inherent difficulty. Yeah. And, uh, but you once said to me, Jim, you once said to me, the problem with AIDS in part is the best minds in medicine are not paying attention to it. Now, yeah. That may have been only in the beginning. In the beginning. But I remember standing outside. This was about 10 years ago. Yeah. And I, I know exactly where you said this to me. And I thought, wow. You know? Yeah, and now finally, you know, they are. They, yeah, and uh, you know, we're beginning to do something about it, at least yeah. in this country. Okay, you know? but then, but your 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 regret is about cancer, that we haven't discovered the cure to cancer, which yeah. kills so many people, five hundred thousand, yeah. whatever it does. How many does it? Do you know the numbers? Doesn't matter. Oh yeah, you know. Doesn't matter. Maybe seven hundred fifty thousand every year. Doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, it matters a lot, but it, but us knowing exactly yeah. doesn't matter. Um, is it just because it's tough? I mean, uh, so we're doing everything we can. Uh, that there's no explanation other than the fact that it's a difficult thing to figure out. Yeah, it's very complicated. Uh, Are you sure that's it? I mean, no, it, it's partly that it's not it had nothing to do with management and organization. People, and, people don't change what they're doing fast enough. Yeah, you know they. Uh, you know, a good scientist realizes <laughs> it keeps, you know, you, you got to, as a scientist, you got to seem somewhat inconsistent. All right, but how about, yeah, exactly. Now, how about this, though? Is it, is the idea of competition, competition, A, good for the end result because you're competing with other scientists and you want the distinction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, everybody wants that, or is it bad because by the nature of competition, there is no sharing? 
Uh, in science, we share pretty much. Uh, it wouldn't be any fun unless you could talk to your enemies. Because you, you want them to see how good you've done anyway. Yes, and, you know, beforehand, you, until you get very close to a problem, you, know, you just say everything you know, you know and with not knowing who's finally going to get the answer. I sort of want to believe things and then go along with it until it's disproved. Yeah. Some people sort of don't want to believe things until, yeah. you know, they're against something until you can't deny right, exactly it. Exactly right, 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 right. Whereas uh, you I've want, always... You want to believe until it's disproven. Yeah, so I want to, it's much more fun to think this might actually cure cancer, whereas other people say, oh, it's not going to do it. James Watson's president of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York, a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He has received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the National Medal of Science, and with Francis Crick and Maurice Wilkins, the Nobel Prize for Physiology of Medicine way back in 1962. Inside the life of a scientist. Yeah. Did I stay happy instantly? Did I just yeah. go smiling? You yeah. know, well, not very long because uh, after a while, I got bored with DNA. Yeah. In fact, pretty fast. Uh, you had to do something new. And uh, so the new thing was uh, RNA. We wanted to find out how the genes worked. Right. And right. until I knew what the structure of DNA, well, uh, what RNA was, I wasn't going to be happy scientifically. I was going to be discontent. And uh, of course, you've got to alternate doing science with finding some reason that might make you content. Yeah. And uh, uh, this was the pursuit of a girl or girls. Yeah. <laughs> and how did so, that? <laughs> so, do you believe that you have this great? I mean, you are rem in remarkable health. It seems to me. You look great. I mean, you look at this picture of you. I mean, you look pretty good. I was 26 then. Yeah. And you're how old now? Uh, 73. So that we're talking about 50, almost 50 years. Yes. You know. And uh, I sort of feel the same. You know, I can't. I think my brain has changed. Uh, I look different. Well, let's talk about the brain for a second and then come back to the book. It's a, there's lots of things that say, A, we, we all know about cells regenerating. We also have been told that this notion that, that you know, our brain cells deteriorate and, and we know that there are certain kinds of diseases that affect our brain with deterioration of our brain cells. Uh, but there's other new information, I'm told, that yeah, I'm 25 years old, yeah. and uh, uh, I thought people might want to know what happened afterwards. And yeah. uh, uh, some people who read the manuscript said the book should be called The Morning After. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was a big event, and uh, how did other people react to it? And yeah. uh, you know, how long did I stay happy? Because most people think of, when they think of you, they think of the double helix, right? Yes. That's the book. Right. And that happened when you were 25. That's the story of you at 25. Yes. Hence. So uh, I decided to continue it for three more years yeah. and uh, sort of let people know, you know how scientists behave. Uh, there aren't many books that do yeah. it in the detail Take I did. James Watson is here. In 1953, he and Francis Crick discovered the structure of DNA. For this achievement, they won the Nobel Prize and they changed our view of ourselves and the world. He was just 25 at the time, and he was still left with another unfulfilled goal, to find the perfect wife. His latest book, Genes, Girls, and Gamav, chronicles his life just after the discovery of the double helix. I am pleased to have him back at this table. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to have you. Now, why did you write this? What is it you want to tell us? And why do you feel so strongly that this was a book you were uniquely prepared to tell, other than the fact it was your life? Uh, it was a big event, and uh, the book ends... It breaks some... that offers some new ground as to how we stay alert and how our brain works. We seem to be producing uh, some new cells. Exactly. Yeah. And there's great controversy. Are those new cells the basis of new memories? Yeah. Uh, most people say, no, I just have a feeling it has to be partially true. You do? Yeah. We have to be creating new cells. I can't believe you use the same cells to, say, 
uh, memorize Rachmaninoff's third is you do the second. But since we don't know how you memorize <laughs> the second, you don't really know. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask you some questions that, that I would have asked you if you and I were, that you've been asked a thousand times before, but they're curious to me and I think curious to the audience. What's the biggest mystery for you in science? Uh, now it's uh, how we